You're looking at shells that are used for the six inch guns here on HMS Belfast. There are four shell rooms just like this. This cruiser had the ability to fire eight shells per minute. Of course, that would have taken an incredible toll on the crew and the ship, but they started firing on D-Day at 5.27 a.m. The vessel didn't just have firepower, but manpower. With a crew of roughly 800, there was also a sick bay staffed by two doctors and a dentist who also doubled as an anesthetist. Once there were more bunks than this, they, only four of them remained. But Nigel Steele is the Imperial War Museum's curator. Belfast had this sophisticated sick bay where minor operations, triage operations, could be undertaken. He saw these badly wounded men being brought ashore, uh, one of whom was Canadian, the first man to die in HMS Belfast at 10.15 at night, uh, was Gunnar Mayo from Canada, um, recorded in the ship's log. So again, it perpetuates that link with the beach that Belfast sat behind. This is the upper deck of the warship. It would have been the Admiral's Bridge back in the day. It is incredibly windy up here, but just imagine what it would have been like as this vessel crossed the English Channel. The HMS Belfast was one of the lead ships in the operations, and its initial goal was to provide support for the Canadian forces storming Juneau Beach. It stayed in the region, providing support to the Allied forces well into July. The great thing about Belfast is it is the great survivor. It's still here and you can still see it and still get a sense of the strength and the power that it brought to these historic events. Come Thursday to commemorate D-Day, three of the warship's 12 guns will do a simulated fire. It will still be spectacular and loud with smoke and the sound will actually hit about 120 decibels. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, on board HMS Belfast.